Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I bring a lot of love and greetings from West Virginia. During the Middle Ages, ships sailing into sea, into combat, would fly long red streamers as a signal they would fight to the death. By the 1700s, cities under siege were flying red flags that would say they refused to surrender. Today, the phrase red flag has become synonymous with danger. In 2013, we have red flags flying all around us. However, if we don't trust our instincts, we won't see them. If we don't see them, how can we act on them? As a society, we see evidence of our failure to act on red flags in many recent child sex abuse cases. These crimes always carry a higher body count than we know. That's why it's important that we understand what we're seeing when a red flag comes into our field of vision. To help us learn how to do better, let's listen to someone who paid a high price for missing the red flags. This is one mother's story. My husband, he made good money. He had a great job. Only problem was I never saw any of it. He was always too busy spending it on that beer. His drinking, it got worse and worse. Finally, I got so disgusted, I left his dinner sitting on the back burner one night and I went upstairs to bed. His yelling woke me up. Next thing I knew, he was in the room, grabbing a handful of my hair, yanking me out of bed. I didn't know it then, but as he dragged me down the stairs, our oldest daughter, she saw everything. She was seven. I found her sitting in the cold stairwell. I was carrying her back up to bed. Her little toes, they were cold as ice cubes. She was crying when she asked me to divorce her daddy because she was afraid. He moved away 200 miles, transferred to a new job not long after that, so we all felt safer. Only problem was, he never sent money home. So I was grateful, you know, when a family friend started dropping by, bringing us coal to help heat our big old house. Eddie was 18. My oldest daughter, she was then 11. You know, before we knew it, two years had passed. Eddie, he had become like family. He was still dropping by, repairing leaky faucets, splitting firewood. My oldest girl, she was 13, straight-A student. She won the county spelling bee. She was always reading anything she could get her hands on, and if she wasn't doing that, she was playing her piano. Her father, he predicted she would go far. He hoped she'd go to one of those music conservatories one day. She was shy, pencil thin, barely developed. You know, back then, I had some high hopes of my own. I hoped my girls would know what to do if a stranger tried to hurt them. I hoped Eddie was a nice young man he seemed like he was. I hoped my neighbors would help look out for my girls. But you know, hope just isn't enough. I later learned the night my little girl went to Eddie's house to visit his little sister for a sleepover. Well, that was the night his mama gave both those girls alcohol. It was the same night Eddie invited my little girl into his bedroom. What was he thinking? He told her it was just to talk. I know my daughter. She looked up to him like a big brother. I'm sure he made her feel important like she was loved. And so of course she went because Eddie wasn't some random stranger. I've tried to imagine what it was like for her that night. I can picture her sitting on the edge of his bed, her small hands folded in her lap. I can see her long silky hair hanging past her waist. You know, I'd seen the way he looked at her hair. I'd even overheard him tell her how pretty it was. It wasn't supposed to be like that. 
That night, it wasn't supposed to happen for another 10 years. She was supposed to get married first, have a ring, go to college. That night wasn't what I wanted for my baby. It certainly wasn't what her daddy wanted. And I know my little girl, it wasn't what she wanted. The only person who wanted it was Eddie. My husband, he was 200 miles away. That means Eddie was the only man in my daughter's life. But he was seven years older. She was a child. I don't know how I missed all the signs. Looking back, I see every one of them now. She got drunk, she got kicked out of school. She practically attacked her principal. She said she was pregnant. Pregnant, excuse me? She wasn't dating. She didn't even have a boyfriend. I thought maybe she'd just gotten her period, and it was hormones. By then, we'd grown so far apart, I didn't know what to say to her. I just said, I'm disappointed in you. Can someone please tell me how I didn't see what was right under my very nose? I can tell you how, Mom. You saw the signs, but you didn't act on them. That was my mom's story. This is mine. From an early age, I was groomed by an acquaintance molester. That means someone I knew gave me love, attention, and even gifts in exchange for sex. Acquaintance molesters fill a void. They give children things that they need, that all children need. They appeal to at-risk children like I was, children from single-parent homes, children from broken homes, children who have special needs. These molesters groom their victims, which creates a bond, a bond that causes them to feel very loyal to their abusers so that they will even protect them if need be. Today, I educate people about these dangers so they don't miss the red flags like my mom did. Red flags like my getting drunk and acting out, behaviors that were totally unlike me. My mom thought that was normal teen angst. That's a mistake many parents make. She missed the biggest red flag of all when she thought that, and that was Eddie wanted to spend more time with me than my own parents did. After my mom said she was disappointed in me, we never talked about my behavior again until I did get pregnant. Eddie started flirting with me when I was 11. That eventually turned into touching, when no one was looking, of course. He raped me for the first time in eighth grade, not long after I won the county spelling bee, but many months before my period started. I told myself that Eddie would stop if I just asked him to, and that if he didn't, I could somehow make him stop. And then I began believing that Eddie did what he did because he loved me. And I told myself that if he promised not to do it, that he wouldn't do it. And every time he broke his promise, I believed him when he said he was sorry. I got pregnant at 16, the same year my high school was featured on 2020 for having more pregnant teens than any school in the country. Growing up in the Bible Belt, abortion isn't an option, or at least it wasn't then. The only thing I knew to do to help resolve the shame, blame, and guilt I had been carrying around for three years was to get married. By the time I learned Eddie was also grooming other 13-year-old girls, it was too late. I was his wife. So question, what happens 
when you have unprotected sex five times a week. I got pregnant not once, not twice, but three more times, so that by age 21, I had four children, all of whom I love dearly. What I hated was not having any say over when or how they came into the world, having no say whatsoever about what happened to my body. You can imagine what living in this environment would do to your psyche. Have you ever felt like you had no hope, like a miserable life was all you would ever know? I woke up one day knowing that nothing I did could make any change. His abuse had grown so bad, the silence in our home so loud, I couldn't hear myself think. And I knew my sanity was at stake the day I saw myself dropping my babies out a window. That's when I came up with my grand plan. It involved mountains, because we have lots of mountains in West Virginia. I knew I needed to find the tallest mountain on a country road without a guardrail and drive over it. It would need to be a place where we would die quickly and painlessly. At the time, I believed I would be doing us all a favor. Thankfully, before that could happen, I had my aha moment, that split second Oprah talks about. I felt my baby kick. And in that moment, I realized it would be far worse for me to take that tiny life and the lives of four others than it would be to try to endure Eddie's abuse. I also, for the first time, realized just as I didn't ask to become pregnant, my four children didn't ask to be born. And finally, it dawned on me I had a measure of control, because if I stayed alive and protected them, I could help determine how their lives turned out. That day was a turning point in my life. The very first thing I did was find a doctor who would go against industry norms and sterilize a woman who was just 21. I had my tubes tied. Three years later, I walked into the local newspaper office with writing samples and asked for a job. I was terrified, but the editor read them and hired me on the spot. She believed in me. That gave me permission to believe in myself for the first time in years. That job was a game changer. It gave me a mentor who nurtured me, incredible levels of self-confidence that I needed. It gave me an education, and it gave me the chance to discover my voice. That growth I experienced became a conduit for change inside my own home, so that over a period of two years, I went from being an abused wife to an empowered woman, I essentially was transformed. Let me tell you how that looks. I found a therapist who taught me how to trust my instincts. At first, she just thought we needed marital counseling, but then when I opened up and told her the truth, Eddie had been raping me since I was 13, she cut off the marital counseling and gave me individual counseling. It did wonders for my psyche. Not long after I started that therapy, uh, Eddie punched one of our daughters in the stomach outside a movie theater one night. In a voice I didn't even recognize, I stepped between him and my child and said, never touch her again. 
I loaded my children in the car, and we drove off, leaving Eddie behind to walk 15 miles home alone. I finally found the courage to confront Eddie about his sexual violence. But it wasn't until he raped me one last time. The next morning, I wanted to take a ball bat and smash his face. I was so angry. Instead, I just used my words. You raped me last night. In that moment, our roles were reversed. For once, Eddie was silent, but not me. I took my children and left that week. I never went back, and I've never been silent again. Today, since my book came out, I've gotten letters from men and women around the world. Their stories feel far too familiar because they were pursued by a sexual molester who showed more interest in them and wanted to spend more time with them than their own parents did. Where their own behavior should have served as a glaring red flag for someone. I'm struck when I read these letters by how wounded these adults are and how many of them blame their parents for failing to protect them. I'm also struck by their inability to move forward and how much damage they've sustained. It's been more than 30 years since my mom said she was disappointed in me. I've long since forgiven my parents for their failings. My mom really did the best she could. And my dad, he had so many demons, he died trying to drink them away. 30 years later, in 2013, we live in a different world now. A world where we know what to look for, what signs to watch out for. We also know this. We know who to look out for because 95% of victims know their abusers. These are not strangers. These are people who live among us. The other thing we know is that silence is deadly. Silence is a child molester's best friend but a compliant victim's worst enemy. We need to do better. For every one person who's courageous enough to come forward, there are 10 others, at least, who haven't found the ability to break their silence. There's a way we can help them. We can look and try to see the red flags. Trust that little voice within us that tells us something is wrong. Beyond that, I want to charge you to do the one thing that will make a difference. When you see a victim in question, have a frank, loving talk with them. Don't accuse, judge, or blame them. Tell them you will still love them and your opinion of them won't change no matter what they tell you happened. Because acting on the red flags can save someone else's life. Maybe you'll be like me and realize the someone you need to save is you. Thank you.